Everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience Live. It's June 3rd, 2012. Welcome, everybody. I'm Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Jerry DeWitt. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. For those of you who are not aware, Jerry's a former Pentecostal minister. Pente Pentecostal minister. Who is the first graduate of the Clergy Project. We're going to talk to him a little bit about that. Um, and also, we'll be taking your calls. This is a live public access phone-in television program that streams live over the internet as well. Uh, and we're really happy that you all uh, joined us this evening or this afternoon or whatever. But I'm mostly I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm thrilled to be here. It is quite an honor. I have been following this work for a long time. And I'll say hello to my son, Paul DeWitt, who is very jealous that I'm here and he's not. Yeah, well, Paul, come down. <laughs> I'll let anybody sit in here. <laughs> Oh, now I don't feel as good. No. <laughs> so, so why, why don't you, do, you know, kind of briefly go through the process of you finding and getting involved with the clergy project and, and kind of what's happened since then moving yeah. toward recovering for religion? Uh, to be very brief, because I know the callers are the most important part of the show, I, um, I went through 25 years of deconstructing the traditions that I had learned from my family. And in, at the very end of that 25-year experience, I realized that I was completely and utterly alone, or at least thought I was. And so I reached out to the internet. I remembered somebody by the name of Dan Barker. I Googled, contacted, he contacted me back, and he introduced me to the Clergy Project. And the wonderful thing about the Clergy Project is, is that it's a, an anonymous online forum where people who are in situations similar to what I was in at the time are able to communicate uh, in complete secrecy, not jeopardizing their life, not jeopardizing their family mm -hmm. or their friends or their finances or the favor that they have in the community, and try to work their way out of a ministry that they no longer uh, believe in. We found ourselves in a position where we no longer held the supernatural beliefs of our religion. And so the Clergy Project is a, a great online anonymous forum. And actually, you know, it's, it's been growing quite a bit. Yes. Um, it's, you know, people, when, I remember when Dan Dennett uh, first talked about the study that he was doing, saying, we're dealing with ministers um, who are still in the, are in the pulpit, active in the ministry, and do not believe. Yeah. And we were like, wow, I mean, I wonder, you know, how many of those did he manage to find? And in the, stu the original study, there was like five or six that right. we were working with. Right. Um, and then when you got involved, there were... Or probably around 20. Yeah. yeah, probably around 20. And um, the last count that I saw were up to 250 actual members. And during the month of May, we received over 100 applications. Wow. So it's, it's growing. It's extremely exciting. It, so as a side note to all of the believers out there who are going to church on a regular basis, it would be interesting if you sat down and thought about whether or not the person standing in your pulpit right. actually believes the things that you believe. You know, are they are they somebody else? This is a big deal, because I mean, I, I know that you, you've gone through a lot in this in this process out. But what people don't seem to understand is, for a lot of people who are in the ministry, they're stuck. Right. I mean, when your entire life and livelihood is wrapped up in this religious belief. That's right. And especially for a lot of them. I mean, I know you got started at preaching at 17. 17, saved at Jimmy Swaggart's church. Yeah, and I know, I know several other people who also got started there. They ended up going to seminary after they'd actually been preaching and evangelizing for a while. Um, and you develop a certain skill set that is fine-tuned for the church. Right. And you find yourself so many years later um, kind of disingenuously saying things, wondering right. what do I do, and if I leave this, what do I have? Do I have a skill set that I can put to use anywhere? Right. Is, there, is there a position and, and it's, for me? And, and it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. That's obviously all very true. The other side of it is this. As a minister, your life is about serving people. 
And when you begin to see that you may have to disengage from the religious community, and you know that all these other things are going to come about, the loss mm -hmm. of possibly family, finances, favor, friends, all those things, you have to begin to ask yourself, what is my own personal integrity worth? Is it worth that? Mm -hmm. Is it worth my spouse not having health insurance? Is it worth my children never going to college? Is it worth my family being ostracized in this small community? Is it worth all of that? And, you know, this is real life issues. It's, it's very easy for, especially even me, now that I'm on the other side, for us to stand up and say, you know, just be honest. Stop, stop telling lies. And I think the majority of the people in the clergy project are not lying. They're trying to dance around the language any way they can, working out their exit strategy. But the reality of it is, it's just not that simple. It's I, very I wonder how many of them, and, and I'm not asking you to break any confidences or anything, sure. but I've always wondered how many of them uh, continue to do this and try to do good from the inside, yes. to soften the message, yes. to l kind of lead people towards a more enlightened you know, path about this and and let's get it you know we, we've lost a lot i mean if you go back to the fire and brimstone stuff you oh, don't hear quite sure. as much of that as you used to anyway right. and so you've got christianity in particular and other religions as well divided up into the you know the the hardcore fundamentalists and then the moderates and the liberal right. you know theists and i wonder how many of the how many members of the clergy perhaps for years many many years decades centuries even have been oh i'm in here and i've i've learned something new Right. Um, that conflicts with what I've been teaching and what everybody's been taught. Is there a way that I can work this in to try and educate you know, the flock from within? That's exactly what I tried to do. The last church that I pastored was a, a, a community church, a very small community church. And I really thought I could go be, I didn't know the language, mm -hmm. I didn't know the terminologies, but I really thought I could go be a Christian humanist was what I was really working towards and didn't even know it. Unfortunately, by the time people connect to the clergy project, they are so, this is going to be Christianese, so weary, mm -hmm. so weary of carrying the burden of living multiple lives, sure. multiple personalities, that they're really just trying to find a way out. And what the Dennett and Lascola study has, has found is that it really depends on their age. If they're young enough that they can get a new job, get a new educational set, then they'll probably make a move real quick. If they're old enough, they may can bear the burden for a year or two until they can reach their retirement. It's all of those middle you know, years that is just absolutely impossible to deal with in a lighthearted way. Now, moving on from the clergy project, we'll get to calls in a couple minutes, but um, you know, we, we have a mutual friend in Daryl Ray yes. who uh, put together Recovering from Religion initially, and you have now taken over. I don't know what your, is your title, president, executive No, director? he's the it's, president for forever and ever. For as long as there's an ever, he's the president. But you're the man. I'm the executive director. I'm the figurehead. I'm the 15 minutes. Har I'm hardly the flash a in the pan. Yeah, the, the staff. The staff does all the work. Sarah Moorhead, she's the uh, executive deputy director. She really does all the work. And we've got a core group of volunteers, wonderful people, who are, are doing this fantastic work, very similar to the clergy project, but not limited to clergy. Right. So it's people who are working their way out of religion, some anonymous, most not, but basically they're coming to small groups where we're dealing with the core issues that people face as they're leaving one culture and going towards another culture. And we help them make that transition. We kind of consider ourselves like a, you know, a hospital. We're just there till they get better. Then we send them off to the rest of you guys. Well, it's, um, you know, it, it, these are questions that we get a lot, both on the show and even more so in email. And I get, I get email from people who are going through situations where you know, you've got potential custody battles. You, sure. You've got lots of family issues. These questions come up a lot. I'm glad you're here. Um, looks like our first caller is actually going to be related to that subject, so we'll go ahead and get started real quick. Uh, Ida in Florida, how are you? Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for waiting. Hi, Jerry. Hello, um, Ida. I just wanted to um, say I'm really happy that I got to talk. I'm getting to talk to you. I've been wanting to talk to you for a very long time. Um, I was a Roman Catholic all my life. I'm 35 years old, and, you know, I, I've never felt like I fit in. I always felt really weird going to church. I just, you know, I didn't feel anything, and um, it was just really weird. So then I started going online. I found you, and I found your show, 
And because of you, I'm now an atheist. Wow, well, thanks. Want to say thank you so much. <laughs> you, you did the work. We just provided information, but thanks so much for saying so. You're thanks. like the best debater. I watch, um, you know, oh. your debates here in Tampa yeah, and uh, just many debates you had online. It's like nobody could debate you. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> well, I hope there are still people that can debate me because I like doing it. But thanks so much. <laughs> You, you were I wanted to ask you one thing, though. Like, you know, I, my daughter, she's 14, and, you know, she's open about being an atheist also, like, in her school. And ever since, you know, we came out and told people openly, just how do you deal with the negativity? Because the people, the kids in her school and um, people that I tell, it's like, you know, they're just so negative. Mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that? Do you want to I start? mean, what do you... It's like, I don't, there's not too many atheists around here, um, but it's, uh, but it, they're just really negative, you know, the stuff that they see, say, um, it's like, how, how, what do you suggest? How do you deal with people like that? Well, Ida, the, the first thing that I do is, um, I've, I've kind of created a niche for myself in that I just really try to love everyone out of my way. And that may sound a little odd to say it that way, but because they expect a certain amount of a fight and they're, they're looking for a fight, I really just try to show them as much love as possible. Now, that's kind of easy for me because that's my thing. That's my personality is I love truth and I, and I love people. Not everybody is wired the same way. I, I honestly had to avoid certain situations. Uh, when I knew that there was going to be a fight, I can remember one example where I desperately needed some stamps and I pulled up to our little post office. I'm from a town of 10,000. I started to walk in. I saw who was in there, and I just turned around and walked out, and quite honestly, the bill was late because I didn't have a stamp because I just wasn't in the mood for the fight that day. Mm -hmm. But what we've learned through recovering from religion is that for everything that you have to remove yourself from as you leave the religious community, you have to find to something to replace that. And so with the power of the Internet, and there, there may actually be more people out there than what you're aware of at this moment, I would do everything I could to connect, 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 connect. Do everything you can to find those people. And probably just being on this show is going to connect you with people that you never knew were in your area. The community has saved my life. Honestly, the community has saved my life. Yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't disagree with Jerry. My, my, my approach probably isn't. I know my approach isn't identical to his, um, and, and it's, you know, every situation is going to be a little bit different. Obviously, I don't know exactly what you're going through. What I do know is that, one, every time I hear from somebody who says I'm the only atheist in my area, uh, inevitably they're really, really wrong. Um, and, and one of the things we tried to do uh, over at Iron Chariots, there's a list of uh, organizations, and we, we probably need to do a better job of building that up. Um, so that you can find people to actually socialize and interact with so that you know you're not alone because building a community and, and work, working with a community is critical. But my, I, don't, I don't know how much negativity I ran into, but when I do, I tend to try and be kind of straightforward and analytical about it. And by that I mean, um, okay, I understand that you know, if it's a relationship that existed before where I'm losing a friend, where somebody's disconnecting from me, mm -hmm. um, I have to own the fact that of the two of us, I'm the one whose position has changed, and that is mm, my responsibility. And I will own up to that. And if they no longer want to associate with me, that's one thing. But if they want to abuse me, that is something that I don't have to take at all. And then in response to that, my thing is, okay, what really changed about me? What is it about me that is different now from before that is causing you to react in such a hostile, negative way? Because as far as I can tell, it's the fact that I don't believe the same thing that you believe, and in particular, I don't believe this claim, which you don't seem to be able to prove anyway. Um, so you, why, why would you be so offended that I just don't agree with you on this? Um, now, I can understand you know, the offense, especially if in my position where I, I not only don't agree with them, I think they're, they're wrong. I think that, you know, okay. that, that, that these God claims are delusional. Um, and I understand that that offends and bothers people. And so, you know, I, I own up to that. I can't imagine, I mean, I did this in my 30s. I can't imagine being a 14-year-old kid and, and being openly atheist in the face of hostility. I know what I was like at 14. Yeah. Um, 
I didn't have I didn't have the balls just to talk about you know my inner self at 14, um, even if I had been an atheist. And there were plenty of other subjects that I was probably uh, you know kind of closeted about, for lack of a better term. So you know, kudos to your daughter for for actually Absolutely. doing that. Um, the one thing is that by being yourself. You have to be comfortable with the fact that being yourself is going to be a reward mm -hmm. unto itself. That's right. And that you, I didn't end any relationship that ended over my atheism. There's not a single individual with whom I used to have a relationship that I don't now where I ended the relationship. They all ended the relationship, and that's on their head. That's right. I did not do anything that would have or should have ended a relationship. And you have, to be, you have to be honest with yourself about these relationships and how important they really are. Obviously, when you're going through this situation, everything is magnified. All of your emotions are on high alert. When things started coming out about me, I went through, I guess I had about 200 friends on Facebook at that time. I went through and could only find eight people that I really, really cared about talking to mm -hmm. about this issue. So, you know, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. Yeah, Being yourself is your own reward. There's an aspect of that, too, which is if the only way I can get these people to like me That's and right. care about me is to be something I'm not, do I really want those people? I mean, people ask all the time, should I come out? And we had a little conversation about this this morning after Jerry's talk. Um, and my answer has been, well, it depends. You know, definitely if you think your, your life or livelihood or your happiness in general is just going to suffer from it, then by all means don't. Let the rest of us who are out continue to work to build a safer world where you can come out, where we can all be out. Um, but what I do say is that if you're considering coming out, be sure that you're ready to face the That's consequences right. of that, that you're comfortable knowing, hey, I'm going to sever... There are relationships that are going to be severed because of this change, and it's not my fault, and I'm okay with that because I'd rather surround myself with people who like me for me. That's right. It's one of the reasons, once again, to reiterate that the community is so important, yep. and the community is there, especially for this 14-year-old atheist. There's a huge community for her. You, you have to accept, as hard as it is to accept, that this is going to carry with it waves and waves of negativity. That's just a fact. There's no secret way of doing this where everybody in the world's going to love the fact that you no longer believe this mythology. Yeah. And the, the, last, the last point I'll make on this, because you're talking about dealing with the negativity, is, and this is, there's just no way to say this without really irritating some people. Um, by and large, with a handful of exceptions, I am not mad at religious people for their reactions to atheism or me or anything else. I, uh, pity probably isn't the right word, but it's close because they are very much victims of their religion. Yes. The, the religious ideas have poisoned their ability. It's, it's what is responsible for the, for the damage in the relationship. Um, That's right. It, and it, it's partly because it portrays a false sense of love um, right. No doubt, Jerry is, is one of the, the sweetest men that I've ever met in my life, genuinely loves people, it's obvious. Um, we were fast friends right, right off the bat. Um, I also care about people, maybe not necessarily to the extent that Jerry does, <laughs> um, but what I care about is that people treat each other in a way um, uh, that is based on reality, that right. is based on let's figure out exactly whether or not, not every, not every two people should be in any kind of relationship. Right. And so religion gives this false That's idea right. that, oh, we're all brothers and sisters, we should all love each other, we should all get along. There's going to be conflicts. There's, there's going to be two people who just aren't going to get along. And so religion's trying to, to mend a relationship that is perhaps unmendable. And it gives people a false idea about what it means to love, what, about, what it means to interact with people. And then when you find out that they no longer believe what you believe, what happened to that love? Wait, That's weren't right. you supposed to keep loving me? That's right. And actually, um, she's sitting right here next to me. She's listening to you. And, um, you know, she said ever since she came out, she's been kind of bullied. Like, I see kids writing nasty messages to her on Facebook or, you know, she tells me 
uh, what kids tell her in school, and it's really sad, you know. But it's, I tell you, um, it's not just sad. You have to take action. That's right. You have to take action. You have to contact the school administrators. You can contact the Secular Student Alliance. You can contact the ACLU. You can contact the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Um, bullying is not to be tolerated at all. M mistreating kids are going to snipe at each other, and there are people, you know, I, there are people who are always going to hate me. Uh, and I'm okay with that because they're the haters. They're the people who are less than by Do definition you of kids, hating. Like any of you, like in school, or I don't have kids in school, and well, you, your yeah, son's twenty. My, my son, um, he's fortunate in the fact that instead of being a fourteen-year-old girl, whenever he began to be public about his non-belief, um, he was already a sixteen, seventeen, eighteen-year-old, uh, very big guy. So he didn't get bullied um, that way. But it definitely severed relationships, and there was things said about him that obviously were not true and were inappropriate. So there is a certain amount of that that is going to be natural within the dynamic of you know high school relationships. But as Matt says, the bullying cannot be tolerated. That has to be taken to the authorities. It has to be dealt with. And there's 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 fallout from that too. That sure. it doesn't it doesn't solve every problem. But what it does is. Every individual that actually speaks out makes it easier for everybody else. This is what, for example, Damon Fowler found out, um, you know, or, or one of Damon's big questions was, why, why the hell didn't anybody do anything before I did? Why did I have to bear the entire brunt of this? And as long as, as long as we keep succumbing to the bullying tactics that attempt to silence people, then somebody else is going to get bullied, and then somebody else is going to get bullied. Um, yeah, we, we've got to take action in that. I know that JT is working on um, Secular Safe Space as a project for making sure that uh, educators can provide places where kids can go, where they know that they're going to be free from this, uh, this, this bullying is what it is. And there's a small piece there, just to add on the end, of turning the other cheek mm -hmm. that we've received through our religious backgrounds that is obviously inappropriate in many, many situations. And yeah. this is one of them. Yeah, I, I, I've gone on record, and, and I apologize, I, we're gonna have to let you go at this point. I hope, I hope we got to your, the crux of your question. Yes, thank you guys, um, and thank you, Matt, for um, be, you know, doing such a good job. And um, you know, it's been um, um, such a relief uh, becoming an atheist. It's like uh, the burden you know, has come off. It's, um, Absolutely. You know, I don't know. Your eyes open up to everything, and I don't know. I can't tell you what a relief it is. <laughs> I, I, I am there with you 100%. And, you know, please feel free. Contact us again. Let us know what's going on. If, if things have improved, drop us an email. Um, and you, if you're looking for contact information for organizations that can help, you can send us an email as well. Hey, thank you, guys. Thanks so much. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, man, it's hard. It is hard. And that's the part, I, I, when I, I was naive, when I went in the clergy project and I began to uh, receive counsel from people who had already been out, mm -hmm. been out for a while, I honestly thought I could figure out a way to make this type of move that wouldn't be damaging. And it's just not there yet. Not in this point in time in our, in our history. You know, what's, you know what's really sad? The move the other direction? Mm -hmm. Yes. Not damaging at all. Right. It's like a Do promotion. You, you know how rich I could be tomorrow sure. if I flipped sure. and found Jesus? Right. I mean, it's a good thing I'm ethical. Yeah. You could sell DVDs by the millions. It would be insane. Yeah. Oh, you know, atheist guy does TV show for six plus years calling Christians, you know, idiots, and now he's a Christian. Ha ha ha. You said. He who shall not be named, which you probably don't know about, um, <laughs> got a bunch of press because he got yeah. some help from a Christian group, became a Christian for two or three days, and then went back to being an atheist. So, <laughs> so if I lose my job and my mortgage is due, I might put out a call to churches to see if they'll uh, if they'll loan me the the money to to cover it. We'll take up an offer. Robert in D.C., how are you? Hi, I'm good. Uh, my question for y'all today is, uh, as atheists, uh, I guess, isn't atheism as dogmatic as theism? And isn't agnosticism a more logical way of thinking? No and no. And why, and why, why is that? I can clarify, but I want to make sure you turn it down so that we don't get feedback, because I heard myself. Um, 
First of all, atheism isn't, all right. isn't as dogmatic as religion because it's not an ism. It's a response to an ism. It is the position that I don't accept your God belief. It is not a declaration of absolute certainty, and it is not anything that we're asserting is necessarily true, um, that there are, in fact, no gods. What we're saying, what atheism is, is this, I don't believe. And um, the idea, first of all, agnosticism and atheism aren't mutually exclusive terms. One addresses right. what you believe, one addresses what you know or claim to know. And so they can be coupled because knowledge is a subset of belief. Um, so Gnosticism and agnosticism is a subset of atheism and theism. So you could be an agnostic atheist, and most atheists are, or you could be a Gnostic mm -hmm. atheist, and most atheists are not, and it depends on your definition of knowledge. But if I ask you, do you believe in God, and you say, I'm an agnostic, you haven't answered the question, because I didn't ask you what you knew. Right. I asked you what you believe, wh whether or not you believe in a God. And on that, there are only two options. I, if you believe, you're a theist. If you don't, even if your answer is, I don't know, or I'm not even sure what I believe, you're an atheist. Because I, I fail to see how you could actually believe in a God and not recognize that you believe in a God. I mean, right. to me, theism is a positive assertion that I do believe in God. And if you can't make it, that you're an atheist. Now, th that is... Uh, by and large, dictionary atheism, and that's uh, kind of a philosophical look at it. Who atheists, uh -huh. who atheists are, what we do, what the atheist community is about, it's about a whole lot more than just, I don't believe in a God. Right. There's, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. It's not, it doesn't derive directly from atheism. It is just positions that are consistent with atheism. My atheism is the product of my skepticism. Right. Um, my... Views on certain, certain things are based primarily on my humanism. These are all, uh, they're, not, they're not contingent upon one another, but they're consistent ideas. Yeah, the little creed that I, I quoted um, during the presentation earlier today, skepticism is my nature. Free thought is my methodology. Agnosticism is my conclusion. Atheism is my opinion. And humanitarianism is my motivation. Yep. And so that, that sums it up for me. Another, another quick point with that would be the dogmatic nature of religion is top-down. And, of course, we try, to, um, we try to not give that appearance sometimes by saying, now, don't take my word for it. You know, read your Bible and find it for yourself. But that's really an exception to the rule. That's something that is said but not necessarily practiced. The whole point of religion is to follow someone. That's what religion does. That's part of the right that you're involved in. Where my experience with atheism has been exactly the opposite. It's actually from the ground up. Each and every individual that I've met within the movement has absolutely, they may be starstruck because they're celebrities throughout our culture, but they are not in any way obligated to anyone out there, regardless of how many books they've sold or how many lectures they give. It doesn't matter who that person is. If they get up and they say something that is scientifically wrong or fails to meet the test of reason, they will be called on the carpet for it. Yeah, it's, it's not an ism. There's no tenets. There's That's no right. instructions. There's no uh, authorities. There's no rituals. There's none of the, none of the things, in the, and there's no dogma because they, we're not asserting anything that, that is beyond question. Uh, religions do assert that things are beyond question, even when they pretend that you can question right. it. It's, it's that this is true. Uh, it reminds me, we were, we were in Kamloops, uh, I was in Kamloops recently and had a debate, and you know, w one of the opponents was talking about um, how it's just true. If the God exists, and if you're open and honest, he'll reveal himself to you. And my question was, okay, why, has, why didn't I get this revelation? And, you know, it, it, what, did I just not try hard enough? And his answer was pretty much, yeah, you, you really just, yeah. you had some bias or you didn't try hard enough. And to me, that's, that's absolutely despicable. And it's yeah. based on this idea that, oh, I can't possibly be wrong about this. And the Bible can't be wrong about this. And so the Bible says God will reveal himself to you. I've had what I think is this revelation. So clearly it's true, which means that if you haven't had this revelation, it's your fault. Right. That's how they get to the unquestionable aspect of it. There's nothing remotely like that. Yeah. In a, there's nothing in atheism, but nothing like that. And it's one of the most disgusting parts about religion is because it, it is seen as being your fault 
if you don't get this revelation or if you don't have this understanding, then once again, instead of having a situation where you have the burden of proof being put upon the person making the claims, you have something even worse than that. Not only is there no burden of proof, but also the guilt is shifted to the person that mm -hmm. doesn't see it. So a claim is made, and if you don't see it, then you're at fault. It's, uh, it's filled inherently with guilt. Yeah, well, I mean, there's no question that religion is, you know, is not, is not sound way of thinking. But, you know, in my opinion, and this is what I don't understand, is I guess so you're saying atheism is sort of like, like your opinion is, is what you were saying, is, is you just don't believe personally Correct. That, that, that something can be there. No, uh, instead no, well, of the belief that you're not sure whether one, something is there or is not there. Yeah, the example, the example there's, a, there's a burden of proof that goes with the claim that a God exists. The example that I've continually used is a court case. If the, the, the fact of the matter is the defendant on trial is either guilty or not guilty, or guilty or innocent. Um, that's the fact. They either did the crime or they did not do the crime. And likewise, a God either exists or does not exist. But the question for the jury is not, did they actually do this? It's what do you believe about the claim that they did do this? And so that's why g juries don't vote guilty or innocent. They vote guilty or not guilty. And those people in the not guilty category may actually suspect that the individual is guilty. There just wasn't enough there to convince them. They don't have to be convinced of innocence. Likewise, on the question of the existence of God, um, there are people who are convinced, as I am, that there actually are no gods. There are other people who just aren't convinced that the various gods that have been um, suggested actually exist. And so the, the line that I, that I used was, I find the defendant God not guilty of existing. If you can't see the distinction between saying not guilty and God. saying innocent, then you'll never see the distinction between atheist and perhaps anti-theist. Right. And it, it also sounds like the same old story of if you have an opinion, mm -hmm. then you're being dogmatic. You know, if yeah. you're sharing an opinion, you're being dogmatic. And that's not a fair argument. Yeah, the closest, the closest thing to, uh, and, it, and it's not even dogma, but the closest thing to a flat assertion that atheism makes is that theism hasn't met its burden of proof. Right. And, and I, I'll, keep, I'll happily defend that in a debate anywhere anybody wants to, because theism hasn't met its burden of proof. No brand, mm -hmm. no doctrine, no denomination of any branch of any religion has actually met its burden of proof. And some of them not only recognize this, but assert that they couldn't ever possibly, oh, I couldn't ever possibly prove right. to you that a God exists. Okay, then why are we talking about it? That's right. Just take it by faith. Just trust me because you like me. Yeah, and, if you, and th that gets down to the you have to believe to believe. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. How the hell does that make sense? And, yeah. and where, where, else in the, where else in reality do you hear the sort of excuses and arguments and language twisting that you hear in this, right. you know, the discussion about the existence of God? Right. And faith... Um, it's what adults call pretending. <laughs> that's, that's what faith is. It's pretending. Yeah, I, I, used to, I used to have a bunch of different working definitions of faith, but I've, I've changed to where faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have a good reason. Right. So pretending is a good shortcut for that. <laughs> Robert, I hope that gets to your question. Thanks so much for calling in. Thanks. We've got, um, ooh, I can't even find the right number there. There we go. Uh, Simon in Norway, how are you? Hello. Very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Okay, wonderful. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, logical absolutes or uh, logic, uh, and uh, in in relation to the tag argument, I guess. So I, my wife just left the room. <laughs> <laughs> she would love that. Um, yeah, sure. What, what did you want to say? Um, uh, the argument is that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, that uh, logical absolute has uh, has uh, a conceptual nature, and uh, I think this is wrong because uh, logical absolutes are natures of things that exist. So, yeah, except that uh, they can't they can't have natures because they are natures. In the same respect that colors can't have colors. Because they are colors. 
Except that the, log the three logical absolutes, uh, the foundations of logical thought, identity, non-contradiction, and excluded middle, um, they're true even if nothing exists. That's why they're absolutes. They're not, they're not contingent upon things. Now, there, there wouldn't be anybody to recognize that they were true without, without something existing. This is, a, this is a really heady conversation that we had a 45-minute discussion with, uh, what's his name, Matt Slick, um, ages ago, and we're probably not going to be able to rehash it in the remaining time on the show without me getting stuff thrown at me. Um, <laughs> but if you want to send me an email, if you want to send an email to tv at atheist-community.org, I'll happily talk to you about it and, and spare everybody else from what is, I love it, but it's a really tedious topic. Yeah, well, Matt, the case is that I agree with you in just about everything. Okay. I'm an atheist, so I just want to give then you you're right about just about everything. Examples <laughs> of why the logical absolute doesn't work the way Matt Slick thinks they work. Well, I agree they don't they don't work the way he does. But we can once you send me an email, we'll talk about it offline because we may actually agree. Yeah, we agree. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, cool. But uh, the short. I, 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 given the short uh, thing, given the short version of the show. I, Given the short version of the show, I'm not going to spend time talking about tag if we agree on it. I love you. But you love me. We all agree. Thanks so much for calling in, Simon. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, doing, not doing tag with people I agree with. Yeah. Uh, Ron in uh, Canada, how are you? Good. How are you guys doing? Doing very well. We're, we're all right. Doing, I think we're having a good time. Saw a great show <laughs> last night. Had a great meeting this afternoon. I'm Excellent. Happy. Well, uh, I listened to your show last week, Matt, mm -hmm. and uh, I just uh, I really appreciated something you said last week um, that you had struggled at one time with having anger against the Christian himself mm -hmm. as opposed to the faith um, and seeing the the Christian as a victim as well, and uh, that really that really uh, meant a lot to me to hear that because. Um, I found myself exactly the same way, being so angry at Christians, thinking they're so stupid, not realizing I was one of those stupid people. Yeah. <laughs> and, that that uh, was part of the realization, was that, I, I used to say I didn't get smarter. Um, I think it depends on your definition of smarter as to whether I did actually get smarter. Um, my IQ didn't go up, or, and... Uh, you know, I, we're all gullible about certain things. We are all duped. We all live our lives, you know, based on inference and induction. Nobody's immune to being fooled. And when you live your entire life surrounded by a bunch of other people who have been fooled, yeah. um, it's really easy. As a matter of fact, it's difficult to break out from that, yes. that you know, constant environment, that environment of constant reinforcement. Um, Absolutely. I mean... Uh like, uh, you, you know, I was a Christian for 24 years and went on a two-year journey and uh, uh, became an atheist. It was a long process for me. And, um, you know, I firmly believe that one of the things, one of the problems is, especially for Christians to come out, is that uh, the whole faith is based on fear. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they're afraid to, to look at the other side of what the other side might be say because if by chance it contradicts what they believe then what are they going to do yeah there was oh, a, there was the somebody losing their salvation yeah you know, it, it, it does play do? on it does you know? play on our natural fears and religion not only plays on our natural fears but religion also manufactures fears as well. Somebody had referred to it as religion poisoning people and then offering them the antidote. Yeah. Um, but Beth, yeah. Beth came up with the idea because we're talking about this constant argument that we hear about you've got a God-shaped hole in your heart. Right. Well, religion punches a God-shaped hole That's in your exactly heart right. and then offers you the, the God to fill it. Yeah. Um, and it can only be filled with, with yeah. the God that they're offering. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you, you, you can't forget that religion is, is more than just showing up for Sunday school or attending service. Mm -hmm. yeah. Religion is our culture. Yeah. It's, it's the place that we're at in history today. Absolutely. And so that hole is punched in your heart from a lot of different directions. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that, that makes it difficult and which causes me to have sympathy is, as I like to say, the same people who taught me the sky was blue and that the stovetop is hot are the same people that taught me 
what I was feeling was the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The same right. people that, that taught me the fundamentals of, of my religious experience. Yeah. So as a child, it's pretty difficult to know when to shut off the learning. Yeah. You know, when to it, stop believing what you're told. It's actually, it's, you know, we've, we've talked about it before from an evolutionary standpoint. It's a good thing that children are born um, with a, kind of a natural intuition to trust the people who are older than them because they know better. You can learn quicker. If, right. if we had to, if we had to learn everything ourselves, so society would never progress. You know, right. You'd not see any really big changes. But we have the ability to stand on the shoulders of all the people who have come before us. We take shortcuts to learning. This is what allows us to make grand leaps to why, you know, I've got a, a cell phone that talks to my car and I can That's navigate right. around with it and all that. I mean, we would never have gotten there had it not been for this ability. But what it does is it imposes upon us an over-dependence on authorities and perceived authorities. That's right. yeah. We can't all be experts on everything. It's absurd. We can't all learn everything. We, right. Even experts in a particular field cannot reasonably be expected to know everything about their field. There's just too much information. Right. That's right. And so we tend to rely on things. And we, the, the, only, the only damage that's done is when we rely on authorities without question right. or when we over rely on them. David Hume has a, a, one of my favorite quotes, I think it's my Facebook quote, which is the wise man apportions his belief to the evidence. And we should apportion our reliance on authorities to the degree, first of all, that we even understand what the authorities are saying, Right. the recognized exper experts in a field. Yeah. I, know, I know next to nothing about uh, cosmology and, and stuff like that. I recognize that Lawrence Krauss is an expert in this area, um, and I, uh, I try to do my best to understand what's, what the scientific experts are saying about early models of the universe and things like that. Um, to the extent that I understand them, I can say, yeah, um, I, I, I guess I kind of agree that that's the model that seems to be working, that seems to be producing results. Um, but I don't, I don't claim absolute, well, I don't claim absolute certainty about anything, but I don't even claim a high degree of certainty about the big questions, you know, Big Bang Cosmic, yes, Big Bang happened, uh, we've got observations from cosmic microwave background radiation, yeah. um, but my understanding of that field is so minuscule that it could, from where pretty, I sit, it could turn on its head field. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it could turn on its head tomorrow, and I'd just have to say, okay, oh, well, you're just having faith in the experts. No, I'm not, I'm not having faith because, first of all, I have good reasons to trust the experts in that right. field. Yes. And second of all, I am not asserting that they're right. And science doesn't assert that it's discovered truth. Right. It just builds models and theories that are the best, most reliable, most consistently reliable, independently verifiable explanations of the observations of the universe. Yeah. And as long as you realize that, you're not hanging yourself out on a limb of, oh, my whole world's going to fall apart because Lawrence Krauss was wrong, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and on, nuts. on top of all of that is also just life. Yeah. Day in, day out life, where yeah. you're trying to pay the mortgage, you're trying to raise the kids. You know, do you really have time to go get a theological degree on the side so that you can, you know, debate the Southern Baptist guy who's witnessing at your door. There's just, there's, there's a lot to this. And real life does get in the way of becoming an expert in things that ultimately end up being very important. Why are you picking on Southern Baptists? Well, because I'm Pentecostals and Southern Baptists aren't really sincere or they would be speaking in tongues. Well, I'm, I, was, I was Southern Baptist and you guys were the crazy people dancing around the pews and, and speaking. That's not in the Bible. Let me, let me, <clears throat> let me tell you a quick story, real yeah. quick story. Please. I'm, I'm getting... Oh, I'm, let, me, let me let Ron yeah. go. Thanks so much for calling Hi, in, Ron. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys. You guys are doing a great job. Thanks so much. Okay. This is, this oh, is how a little thought can get in your head about that and work on you for, for the rest of, rest of your uh, ministry career. I, you know, I just started being a Pentecostal minister, so I'm probably 17, 18 years old, and <clears throat> I'm living at my grandmother's. My grandfather had stopped going to church for quite a ways before then, and so I'm getting dressed one Sunday morning. I'm sitting down on the couch, putting on my black dress shoes, you know, didn't look a whole lot different than I look now, just maybe a little lighter. And so I'm putting on my shoes, and he says, Jerry, he says, I want to tell you something. And he was such a quiet, kind of backwards person, it really caught me off guard. And I said, yes, sir. He said, this morning, you're going to go to church, and all of you Pentecostals are going to condemn all of the Baptists to hell 
because they don't speak in tongues. And I said, well, duh, you know, <laughs> you know, yes, of course, you know. And he said, but at the same time, across town, all the Baptists are going to get up and preach that that speaking in tongues is of the devil, and they're going to preach all of you Pentecostals into hell. And I'm like, but they're wrong. And he said, and once y'all are done, y'all are both going to meet up at the chicken place and eat fried chicken. And I thought, holy cow, we don't believe anything. <laughs> yeah. And, and we'll play softball against each other unless our churches are too small, and then we'll be on the same team yeah, against the Methodists. That's right. You know. We could be trying to eva you know, evangelize you poor Southern Baptists that's never been filled with the Holy Ghost, but instead, we need your catcher. Well, the other thing is, and I didn't find out about this while I was a Southern Baptist, because this annoys the hell out of me. Right. First of all, the entire speaking in tongues, handling snakes, drinking poison, that's Mark 16, 9 through 20, which right. doesn't appear at all in the Old Testament right. manuscripts and is most likely an interpolation. Now you tell and me. Yet, yeah, and now, <laughs> but, but when the Southern Baptists would rail against the Pentecostals uh, for their, their charismatic behaviors and, and, paying attention, and taking this passage literally, why didn't anybody tell me? Well, it shouldn't be in the Bible at all. Right. I mean, yeah, in, it'd be a step the, too in the far. best manuscripts, it shouldn't be there. Because that means that the Bible has something in it that's not right. Right. And that opens both of our houses up to scrutiny. <laughs> and we can't have that. So we'll agree with them that it's in there. We just have to disagree right. on how you're supposed to interpret it. That's right. Regardless of what Leviticus says, we will not throw any stones at glass houses. My mic? My mic's buzzing again. What? It's the power. Uh, yeah, I was, I was faking that. Hopefully, it's it, turning it off and turn it back on, stop the buzzing. That's better. We got Brant in Bir Birmingham, UK. How are you? Yeah, uh, Grant, actually. Oh, Grant. Hi, Matt. Um, Sorry? I'm just going to try and be concise here. So, um, recent, new atheist recently deconverted from Asatru um, after having been an atheist a little bit in my teens. Um, deconverted from what? Exam Sorry? Deconverted from what? Deconverted from Asatru, Norse paganism, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. And, cool. um, you know, now that I've deconverted once again, once again I find myself harkening back to my Christian baggage from when I was in my formative years. And I was thinking about the fact that, you know, going along with your theme of uh, recovering from religion, there's one paradigm from which I'm particularly interested in recovering. It has to do with the fact that uh, in the Bible you have uh, the Christian God giving humanity dominion over the earth mm -hmm. to do with as we please, and all the developments that came along with it, uh, such as eventually leading up to consumerism and the like. And I've been thinking about that and all the environmental damage that worldview has done over time. And as such, now that I'm an atheist again, I get to thinking that, um, how to put this, sorry. I get to thinking that as atheists, I would think that we would, you know, in our reason, have something of a moral duty to actually protect the environment in that we wouldn't poison the air and the water and that we might be a little more considerate of how what we do impacts on the very environment on which we depend and on which future generations will depend. And I was wanting to run the idea by you. What do you think of my idea about a thinking atheists having such a moral duty? I don't know that you can necessarily tie it to atheism, but I agree. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 determining what our moral duties are as opposed to our moral values, um, th there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. And religion, I, I'm, I'm going to stop saying religion. Uh, because we, we, we you know, I want to paint all religion with the same brush. There are very different religions. Um, Christianity in particular right. has pretty much dominated all discussions about morality in the Western world, um, which mm -hmm. I find particularly ironic because Christianity is not only not a moral system, it is grossly immoral. Um, and it is inhibiting our ability. What, it, what happens is that these are really difficult questions that require effort, 
and we <laughs> we are we, we are lazy yes and we would prefer the comfort of certainty even if it's false certainty and the uh, comfort of having a ready easy answer that we don't have to think about and so when you are taught from the pulpit uh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is right, this is right, this is right, this is right. Everything, all the work's been done for you and you don't have to think about it. Unfortunately, when they're wrong about those things, and they're wrong about quite a few of them, um, mm -hmm. that skews people's natural moral compass. They've sacrificed their humanity um, at the altar of these, you know, genuflecting patriarchal domination in religions. Yeah. And... Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, one of the, it's one of the reasons why I want to eliminate religions entirely, or as close to entirely as we can, through reason, not through force and legislation, uh, through reason, so that we can begin to do the work that we need to do. Because guess what? The moral questions and moral dilemmas that we're going to be facing in the future don't get any easier. And right. it's, the, well, the fact that somebody is turning contraception into a moral issue once again in 2012 after having settled it, settled it ages ago, what? Well, you know, that, that makes zero again? sense to me either. I mean, it's I can't just a it. natural preventative measure against having too many babies, isn't it? I mean, we already have 7 billion people on the planet, don't we? That's another sort of environmental well, impact as it, issue. As it, 7 billion people as and we somehow don't make an impact? That seems, to use a British expression, a load of rubbish to me. You, by the way, you don't sound British at all. <laughs> well, I'm an American expat, married to an English woman, and I've been here nigh on eight years. The end of the month makes it eight years. Nigh on sold it for me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, three, three quick things would be, one would, I, I agree with you that atheism is really just about one particular subject. Yeah. It doesn't obligate you in any other direction. That's, I think, once again, a, a bleed over from our cultural understanding of religion, that you can just put a label True. and classify everyone under a particular label, which is what we're trying to get away from. Number two would be that I see, for me personally, atheism is just the beginning. It is freeing me from religion, Christianity mm -hmm. in particular, allowing me to work on these issues, to discover what I feel about priorities as far as these things are concerned. And number three, I think he may have been talking about all my hairspray. It, it's very <laughs> possible that he was launching. Grant, I got to let you go. We're running short on time. I appreciate the call. No, that's quite all right. Th thanks, chaps. Um, I'll be tuning in next week as I normally do. So uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me and talk me through these issues. I might have more questions in future, so thank you. Uh, a few people close mean, enough. Because I actually have friends in the UK, and, and so now I'm making fun of them. And, and I shouldn't <laughs> make fun of callers. I'm having fun. Uh, we appreciate Grant's call. Jonathan in Chicago, how are you? Good, how are you? Not thirsty, evidently. I'm drinking my water like crazy. It's kind of warm in here. It's about 300 degrees. Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys about uh, presuppositional apologetics. Yeah, it's bullshit. Yeah, uh, I had never heard your, your take on it, and I just, I don't know. <laughs> Do you, do you know about this Cy Tin Brubin case? Yeah, he's full of bullshit. <laughs> is he Pentecostal? Here's, here's he the thing. Uh, here's the thing with presuppositional apologetics. I think it is an oxymoron. Apologetics is right. the process of offering the explanations for why you believe. And if you are going to presuppose the existence of God or presuppose characteristics um, without justification that necessarily lead to the conclusion that a God exists, you're not engaging in apologetics. You're engaging in, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, with your fingers in your ears, and I don't care to talk to you. No. Right, yeah, it's... I, I... It's, on some of the debates I've heard, a lot of people have trouble getting past this argument. Atheists have trouble getting past this argument, but it seems like just a bunch of tricks. Well, it's one trick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't. Um, I've seen people struggle with this, and it's, it's probably because, to people who understand burden of proof, the nature of evidence. Um, the foundations of epistemology and how we're actually going to go through determining whether or not something is believable, um, it comes off as so absurd that they're caught completely off guard. If Cy Ten, what's his face, wants to call into the show, 
Um, you know what? I'd rather he didn't, because I've heard from other atheists that he's called in or done podcasts with them with the express understanding that he's not to use the content without their permission. Um, and then he's gone and edited things and thrown it on DVDs and then sold it to make money. And if I don't get to make money off this, nobody's making money off this. So Cy isn't going to be uh, very pleased if he calls into the show. Now, if he, <laughs> wants to, if he wants to have a public debate at some point, okay. As soon as he gets up and stands up and acknowledges that he's engaging in presuppositionalist apologetics, uh, I'm going to eat his lunch, and then we can talk about something else. Yeah, he, he, one of the questions he always asks is, what is your source of reasoning? Like, how do you justify your reasoning? And then he says, if you say through logic, then that's circular. Yeah, except it's not. Um, this philosophical idea that you need to have that that uh, sensory information or even the logical, ab well, first of all, I'm fine with the logical absolutes, but we're not going anywhere near that again today, uh, <laughs> is that you need this is false because even if, you, even if things weren't properly basic, um, the results are what matter. Mm -hmm. And we know that things work by testing them. And so the processes of using logic, using reasoning, lead us to conclusions that are continually reliable. And if you were going to demonstrate that there was some other way of knowing, how would you do that without beginning with logic, reason, and evidence? You can't even begin to establish that your alternate way of knowing is viable and reliable without beginning with this. I'm not just, we're not presupposing reason. We are applying reason because it has demonstrated itself to be reliable. Uh, yeah, it's that's that's time waster arguments there. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, thank you very much for uh, weighing in on that. I really appreciate it. I enjoy the show. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate thank the you. call. Bye. -bye. Um, What's this logic y'all keep talking about? I, I don't know. You're from Louisiana. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it later. Thank John you. in Seattle, how are you? Hey, is this am I on? For about thirty seconds, I wanted you to at least get your comments in. All right, so uh, here's what I'm thinking, okay? I'd like to just get this off my chest and as most succinctly so. Okay, here's my rise of is currently um, true or innate is rather uh, hey, hey John. coming to Hey, John. Hey, John. John. Okay, John. Uh, evidently, we had some problem with John's audio, and now they're putting up the credits which means we're completely out of time. First of all, thank you, Jerry, so much for coming down to Green and doing the show. My pleasure. You're welcome back anytime Wonderful. you get into town. We can have a lot of fun. Thanks so much for the people who are here in the studio audience who will scream and yell at this point. <laughs> and we'll see you all again uh, next week. Uh, by the way, um, we're going to go to, like, uh, El Arroyo, which is this place that, you know, we'll be. Cool. I'll be there, too, learning about logic. <laughs> <laughs> see you next week. Callers.